large group of people. Um, I love my job. The best part of my job as Director of Investments at Empire Life is I get to spend a great deal of time out in the field talking to advisors, getting advisor insights, getting the thoughts firsthand as to what your clients are talking about, what your clients are thinking about the markets, what their hopes and fears might be, and then I'm able to take those insights back to the investment team at Empire Life and incorporate that into how we manage money. So the topic of the presentation is be a better investment, be a better investor, investment concepts uh, for 2019 and beyond. I always like to talk about the origin of uh, the presentation. Where, where, you know, where did the idea come for this? And I'm going to take you back almost a year on this one, um, December of 2018. So almost a year ago. And Christmas Eve of all days. So December 24th last year. Does anyone remember December last year in the markets, the market environment that we were in? Mm. Wow, that was something, right? That was really the first taste of significant volatility that we had in the market since the end of the financial crisis, right? Almost 10 years since the end of the financial crisis, and we got a little brief taste a couple months before that in October of last year. And then December hit, and yeah, markets were in a bit of turmoil. And investors were concerned, advisors were concerned, I was getting a lot more emails and phone calls than usual. And I remember distinctly December 24th, so I was in the office, and it was a really, really bad day. And not necessarily accustomed to seeing that, right? Because normally the lead up to the holiday season, you get the Santa Claus rally, right? You know, people are feeling a little bit more, you know, joyous and positive with the holiday season, and usually markets grind a little bit higher during that time frame. Well, not last year. And December 24th was a miserable day. Equity markets sold off quite significantly. And I remember going home, and so bad day in the markets, you know, the holiday season and all that brings. I was hosting my in-laws, <laughs> right? So that may be better for some of you than it is for me. But I was hosting my in-laws, so that comes with a certain level of angst and required patience as well. And I got to the end, and then I have a young daughter, so it was like, get through hosting the in-laws, and then last minute rush to build some toys and stuff like that, right? And I sat down at the end of the night, so December 24th, and I was just like, I just need something to wind down. I put the TV on, and Seinfeld was on. I'm like, perfect, right? I need a little levity in my life right now, right? And for, I, I, again, I don't know how many of our Seinfeld fans, but there is this one particular episode on, and um, it was one of the older episodes of Seinfeld, where he, he kind of, the episodes were interspersed with some of his monologues from his stand-up routines. And he started talking about, you know, being out with friends and family at a dinner. And he goes, and wait, he goes, when you're in the moment and you're enjoying everything, right? And the waiter comes by and you're like, yeah, sure, more wine, more beer, more everything, right? When you're in that mode of celebrating. And then all of a sudden, you know, at the end of the night when you're sort of stuffed, you've overindulged. And then they come and they present you with the bill. And you look at the bill and you're like, how can this be? Right? Who ordered all this food, all these drinks? And in that moment, I'm like, wow, this, this, you know, I, I equated this to, the, to investments and investors. And I'm like, if investors haven't been paying attention to what's going on in the markets, and they get their statements to come January, and they see the end of December results, they're going to be like, oh, my God, what happened? You know, we've been in a 10-year bull market run, and all of a sudden am I down, you know, so-and-so percent? So I got to thinking, you know, what, what sort of things do investors need in this type of environment? You know, we're making more record highs today as we speak. What sort of environment do invest, what sort of mindset do investors need to be able to navigate this market? So the well, first and foremost is fixing your frame of reference. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you have to go into the investment market with the right mindset. You know, if you're not set up um, with the right mindset for investments, you can do really, really poorly. I used to work as a consultant and I worked with a lot of entrepreneurial clients, right? Like business owners who had a lot of success in their business. And I often found it was really, really, really interesting that great entrepreneurs made terrible investors. 
right? Because they're all about risk taking and going out on the limb and you know being aggressive, and that's not necessarily good when it comes to the investment markets. So instant gratification. We're all guilty of it, right? How many of you stood in the line somewhere today, Tim Horton, Starbucks, somewhere? And we're like, oh, this line. Or stuck in traffic, like, oh, I need to get where I'm going, right? This is a real interesting thing. My dad spent most of his career working at RBC, and they had a term which he brought home, and we often joked about in the house, was RFN. Everyone ever heard the acronym RFN? You know what that means? When do you need this? RFN. Right F and now. Right? That's what he used to hear from his boss. Right? You hear at work, instant gratification at work. Um, really, really interesting. So I have a young daughter, and when she, one of the experiments that she had in kindergarten was they brought home apple seedlings, you know, in the little cup. And my wife and I got a real kick out of it because she brings home this apple seedling. And then the next morning, she runs downstairs, and she runs over to it, and she looks at it, and she says, well, no apples. <laughs> and my wife and I are getting kicked out because we understand that, obviously, this is a process, and you don't buy, you don't have an apple seedling and get apples the next day. But for a five-year-old child, that was the instant gratification that she was looking for. This concept of instant gratification of buying an investment and looking at it the next day, the next month, the next three months... That's not the right mindset as an investor. It makes us worse investors. You should be thinking minimum three to five year time horizon with any investment that you make. <coughs> HGTV, not my favorite channel, but my wife watches an awful lot of it, so I end up picking up some of this through being in the room osmosis, right? And one really interesting thing about HGTV though is if have you watched any of the home flipping shows? Because the home flipping shows are great. Like if you're if you want to get into the right investor mindset, watch a home flipping show. Because people get it. They understand the concept, right? You you go out and buy a, you find an old property, something that's beaten down, you buy it, you rip it apart, you renovate it, you put it back on the market, you make a price, sell it for a profit. Everyone gets that. Right? But what if I told you um, and they get the whole process too, right? So the first step is usually demo day, right? You buy a property, a really beat up house, you go in, you rip out kitchens, you rip out bathrooms. Well, what if I told you the agent, was, the real estate agent was coming that evening to, to put the valuation on the house? Walks in and it's completely torn apart. And they had to put a price on it. Well, we understand that's not the way it works, right? right? You rip it apart and then you fix it up, you get it the way you want it, and then you list it. Well, why don't we take that mentality when we talk about stocks and bonds and mutual funds, right? Because that's the same thing that we're doing as an investment management team. We're trying to go out and find good value companies. Some of them might be beaten up, but the time frame, whether it be you know one year, three year, five years down the line, where you're really gonna add value for investors, that's what's important. So again, as an investor, getting it, understanding home flipping and applying it, to financial assets is really, really important. The problem we have with doing that is because of a thing called mark to market. A system of valuing assets by the most recent market price. Right, it's great. In theory, it's great. You know, if you have a fund, a seg fund, a mutual fund, um, a stock, a bond, you're striking a price on that every day. Right, so you buy a fund, that nav changes daily. You buy a stock, the price changes daily. And that makes us a worse investor because we're constantly looking at what that, you know, like, I'm guilty of it too. You reach the end of the month and you're flipping the chart and looking at performance numbers, right? Because it's there, right? They're printing it now. They're printing a performance number. I want to see how I did. It has nothing to do with how good that investment is because, again, all of the, if you're looking at a mutual fund or seg fund, all of the holdings in that have been bought with a three to five year time horizon for, for, for adding value. And this concept of comparison. So I had this conversation with my neighbor the other day. And my neighbor likes to, my neighbor knows that I work in the investment field, so he likes to, he sort of times being out in the yard when he knows I'm coming and going from work. Have a conversation. Um, 
And he likes to talk about how he's doing, right? We're all guilty of this, right? We have friends, relatives, neighbors, and they say, oh, you know, I bought this fund or I bought this stock and I did really, really well. I'm owning all of these cannabis stocks. I've done really, really well. We've all heard the stories. <laughs> comparison. Make sure you're making the right comparison as an investor, as an advisor. I get the, I get the comment all the time of like, well, you, you know, my, my fund did this or my performance is this relative to some benchmark, whether it be the TSX or an MSCI index or a peer group or whatever. But understand that you have to be choosing the right comparison or you're setting yourself and your investors up for this sort of perennial disappointment. And what I mean by that is, say you meet with a client. We dealt, I dealt with this a lot in the institutional space where you're dealing with institutional pension funds and they have a, a very advanced document similar to an IPS that an investor would have. And it lays out what their investment objective is and maybe it's six to eight percent, okay? Long-term growth of six to eight percent annualized. And you have a particular year where the fund, the particular fund earns 10 percent and they're happy, right? If you look at 10%, they're happy. Their long-term goal is six to eight, they earn 10. You have a happy client who's achieved their investment objective who you will suddenly piss off to the greatest degree if you say the benchmark did 20. So what, right? Unless that's the appropriate benchmark for your particular client, then I say, who cares? And I'm not trying to be flip, I'm not trying to be cavalier about this. What I'm saying is, if your goal is to hit the investment objective for that particular client, right? Not to match what a TSX or some other arbitrary index might be doing. So make sure you're making the right comparison, or else you're just creating angst for your investors, for your clients, right? Because remember, if you're, t if you're earning 10 and someone else is earning 12, maybe they've taken on double the risk to get to that 12. So just make sure you're doing the proper comparison. Now this concept of value averaging. Has anyone heard of value averaging? Quick show of hands. I see a couple of hands. How about dollar cost averaging? Yeah, I have more people have heard that. Okay, so value averaging just takes the concept of, of dollar cost averaging and adds one little piece of important information. Okay, well, let's talk about dollar cost averaging first. I'm going to give you a scenario. So you have a client, they have $2,000 they want to invest in the market. They want to invest that $2,000 over the next 10 months. So by dollar cost averaging, it's simply $200 a month for the next 10 months. Great. great. Dollar cost averaging is great because it applies that discipline, right? It keeps your clients continually putting money into the market, which will, is really, really important for long-term growth. The only issue I have with dollar cost averaging is it pays no attention whatsoever to what the market is doing. So enter value averaging. So value averaging just takes the concept of dollar cost averaging and says, we're still gonna apply a disciplined approach of getting clients money into the market, but we're gonna pay attention to what the market's doing. This is value averaging, same scenario. Okay, so the client has $2,000 to invest. They're gonna invest it over 10 months. But instead of putting 200 a month, every month, we're going to target the growth of their account to be going up by 200 a month, okay? So you see that target growth column, 200, 400, 600, 800, so on and so forth till the end of month 10, where you have $2,000. Markets are gonna go up and down, so let me just walk through the first two lines of this scenario. Month number one is the same as with dollar cost averaging. They're buying a fund, say the fund NAV is $20 a unit. So they're getting 10 units, $200 invested. Now in month two, you'll notice the fund NAV went from 20 to $24. So the markets went up. Okay, so that $200 that was invested in month one is now worth $240. Because markets are up, markets have gone up. To get to their targeted growth level of 400 at the end of that two months, they only need to invest 160 in month two. Markets go up, put in less. Markets go down, put in more. Buy low and ultimately sell high. Let me go back here and look at this again. Dollar cost averaging in this scenario with markets going higher, client gets a return of about 15.4%. With value averaging by simply paying attention to what the market is doing and putting in a little bit more or a little bit less. Same scenario, the return goes to 21%. 
Here they are side by side. That's a significant...